setting up shop. Well, hello and welcome to Setting Up Shop, a Maker Journey podcast. Uh, just to give you a brief idea as to why we exist and what we're doing, I'll just read you our mission statement. So we set this podcast up to share our journeys, including any learning moments from hobbyist to professional in our respective crafts, to inspire others to take similar steps and conquer fears that may be holding them back, and to also hold each other accountable so that we push forward in our respective goals, whatever they may be. Uh, well, that's great. That's the kind of the corporate speak. So let's get to know each other a little bit. Um, I'm going to go around and ask each other a few questions. So first of all, um, Rasmus, yes. if we could go with your full name as much as you want to share on the internet, uh, what your craft is and how long you've been doing it. Well, my name is Rasmus Lewin Stansgaard, but Lewin is the easiest one of the three, I guess, or three of them, I guess. But yeah, I'm, I'm a blacksmith. I've been, I live in Norway, Oslo at the moment, and I have been doing blacksmithing more or less full time for 10 years. Yeah. Okay, ten ten years, poss possibly eleven years. Yeah, you know, it's eleven years since I started. So okay, there we go. Our other host, shall I call you up by name, Heidi? Same question to you. So, uh, what's your craft, and how long have you been doing it? I'm Heidi Lynn Jacobs. I am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I am a potter. Get all those peas in there. Talk about alliteration, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have been practicing my craft for six years total now, and. Um, really started off building my own little pottery wheel in my basement. So it's been a labor of love getting to know this craft and um, actually getting to a place where I'm selling my work pretty regularly. That's cool. And just to introduce myself as well. So my name's Dan Tarrant uh, and I'm a woodworker, predominantly a wood turner. I'm based out of England. Uh, I've been turning for about seven years, but woodworking for over a decade yeah, and uh, we're, we're all at that stage or have been at that stage for a while of actually selling our products. Um, and so part of the reason why we all decided to set, set this podcast up was because we are on different continents. We have different rules. We have different legal elements, different places where we can sell things. And we've all got different crafts as well. So hopefully between the three of us, we've got enough experience and enough analogies and kind of stories we can tell uh, that will help other people thinking about doing the same along on the journey. Um, so Heidi, when did you think selling what you make was a viable option? Well, it definitely was a point where my husband was like, you're making a lot of things, but we're just collecting a lot of things, right? Uh, so I had a lot of things mm. in the house. They were, you know, for the most part, getting to a level of that I was comfortable with releasing them out into the world um, and not just gifting them to family members, you know. Uh, we had a side business previous to the pottery and that was called Slap Stuff Together. So I had a little bit of experience with um, selling work, mainly selling Ben's work. And I really just needed to get into that headspace that I felt that the quality of my products were worth someone's hard-earned dollar. And the other thing was the encouragement that I was also getting from a local shop called Love Pittsburgh. They um, were really looking forward to helping me develop a product for the first time that would go into a wholesale market. So I did get a little leg up with that and a lot of encouragement there. I was going to say that's that's quite nice, isn't it? Because you've you've already they've basically told you that you're ready, rather than you sort of sitting there and waiting um, and kind of potentially hiding behind that that level of fear. That oh, is for quite sure. Natural in there, that imposter yeah. syndrome is is uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it, that spans all disciplines. A hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what what about you then, Raz? When did you start thinking that selling what you make was going to be a viable option? Since you're pretty much born with a hammer in hand and uh, you know just started hitting things to begin with. I, well, kinda, but no. Uh, I honestly, I'm not sure. For me, the whole thing started out of being like finished at blast blacksmithing school and having no apprenticeship available, but really wanting to go into blacksmithing and then just figuring out that because being young and stupid, that's very easy. Let me just do this for a living without knowing any better. And at some point along the way, people took pity on me and bought the shit I made. 
And <laughs> from, from there on, it's sort of kind of like, yeah, I get better and people keep buying things. So uh, I don't know. Okay. But just to go back a little bit further, though, and to make it clear for people, you didn't literally walk out of school, go into blacksmithing school, and then that was it. You, you did a few things in between. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, long story short, I studied media communication in college and then went into the army. And I, I've had a dozen odd jobs here and there, everything from being a journalist to being in charge of the garrison newspaper in the army to working as a movie technician and at local cinema and things like that. And a couple of clothing stores for good measure. So it's more like, yeah, I, I found myself at after the army being at the scout chambery. And a friend of mine was sort of teasing, saying that he was going to up into high mountains of Norway to study wood carving. And I was like, yeah, I would like to do something with my hands, but wood carving though? And he was like, no, oh, but they have blacksmithing. And I, I just was sold <laughs> since, since that moment. So despite the fact you live in, in Norway, uh, you studied media communications and went into random bits of journalism and decided to give up that that potential avenue because it was too difficult to find a job in it and instead started blacksmithing. When you say it like that, it sounds a bit backwards, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, yeah, no, I, I never really had any aspiration to be a journalist. I, yeah. I studied media communication and I was asked through a couple of contacts if I wanted to help out start the, the youth edition of our local newspaper, uh, okay. which I did that for a year and a bit, maybe. Until I turned 20 and I was too old technically to work there and moved on. <laughs> but what's interesting from, from um, both of your experiences, uh, so just you, drawing yours at the moment, Raz, is the mm. fact that you, you had this training in particularly in writing and now one of your current projects is writing a black book about blacksmithing. Yes, uh, which I would like to imagine is soon done, <laughs> but uh, the last... 10, 20% takes at least as much time as the first 80. So yeah. that, that's a work in progress. But yes, I, <laughs> I do like to write, honestly. And I, when it comes to blacksmithing, it's, it's really fun. I just yeah. take words and toss them on a page. Okay, so for, for our listeners, just, just so that everyone here understands. So Rasmus is a full-time blacksmith. Um, yeah. And he, he sells a variety of things in Norway. He also sells things to help other blacksmiths, bladesmiths, and that kind of things, particularly knife grinders. Uh, yes. Whereas myself and Heidi, we are both still full-time employed. Um, Heidi, do you mind, don't have to tell them exactly where you work or anything, but what, what exactly would your day job be? Sure. So I am a, a counter actor slash senior project manager for retail um, point of sale uh, displays. Uh, we do a lot of work for a large um, national brand in the United States. And I travel a lot. So I'm going and I'm overseeing installers. I'm up on ladders installing things myself. I'm uh, I'm an expert in print. I, I understand um, all the different print methods and material. So it's, it's really what I've been doing for the last 20 years. I graduated from Clarion University with a sculpture major, which sounds really odd. <laughs> to you know take that degree and go into my day job but basically my my um direction there was that i was going to be doing like more installation um sculpture so you know big initiatives that surround you when you go into a museum think um Andy Warhol and and yeah. and all of those things where he makes it immersive not just like his pop stuff but um that's kind of the direction i was going in and it's really hard to be that type of fine artist and then find work unless you yeah. go and continue to get like your masters and your doctorates in um, art history or fine arts uh, to become like a museum curator or a gallery professional where you're actually setting up other people's art and i figured if yeah. i'm going to do that uh, I might as well look at what I can do in a retail environment. So I got really interested in window treatments and um, the large stores that are specifically built surrounding a campaign. Um, and then I, I found my first job doing that and uh, just haven't looked back. It's 
it's been a lot of fun. I, I've gone, you know, all different avenues where I, I was a color, color theorist. So I was looking at, you know, making sure color matched. I have a perfect eye for colorimetry. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So they, there's a test you can do. It's just like a bunch of tiny, tiny little um, blocks of color and you put them in order and then they flip them over to see if you get them right. And it's called the oh. Munsell test. So I was, uh, uh, yeah. So that's, that's really interesting. So that, that leads into, I, in, in a previous job, I was an archaeologist and we had the Munsell soil color chart. Okay. So that was specifically for um, the, the various shades of brown that soil could potentially be. Um, so that's quite interesting that, it, you know, Munsell clearly worked in a wide variety of different things and how colors uh, apply across across all sorts of different things. Yeah. For sure. It's um, what your eye sees is the reflection of minerals or, or whatever it, that's giving back the color uh, back to you. So if you're thinking pigments, or in my case now as a ceramicist, um, I'm thinking about the minerals that are built into the uh, the glazes to give that uh, color based on the temperature it was fired to. So I found a passion in that science and then just ran with it. So I studied glass and colorimetry there and how to read glass spectrophotometry to determine what um, where glass was manufactured. <laughs> and oh, wow. um, okay. how colorless the glass actually is. Uh, it's very hard to get a pristine, crystalline clear, um, colorless glass. And um, when I was working for a beverage company, that was really important. And then I also learned a lot about um, fabric dye. So you're talking about like, um, if you know Crown Royal, it comes with these these little bags that are purple with the embroidery. And it's really difficult to get that purple perfect. There's that P alliteration again. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're a but natural, that, Heidi. that really, I mean, the science behind it all really like captured a part of my brain. And then, you know. I mean, that's some heavy science stuff, isn't it? It is. And now I get to um, watch other people do that and just make sure that they're doing it in a timely manner. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a bit easier. With, yeah. With great power comes great Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, okay. So it, it, for anyone who's got this far and hasn't already realized, all three of us, you could also classify in varying degree as nerds. Yes. Um, and that will become more apparent throughout the podcast as well. So if any of you are listening and thinking, oh, I'm not sure this might be a bit too uh, corporate, a bit too kind of business management -y, you haven't got any of that to worry about. We, we are... Just as weird and wonderful as you are as well. Um, and, but equally, we are not exclusive of anyone. Uh, everything that we talk about, hopefully will, someone will find something relevant and something helpful. Um, so for myself, when it, when it came to that thing of working out stuff to sell, um, I had gone down this route before with a different thing. Um, previous woodworking route was building guitars, originally three string cigar box guitars. And then uh, I got offered a job doing, uh, working for Crimson Guitars, actually. Some of you may know that. Uh, and I apprenticed there for a year and I learned a hell of a lot about various types of exotic hardwood. Um, I actually, within my first week there, realized I knew nothing about any of it. So I made a conscious effort to learn because I assumed that's what everyone did. So very similar to your kind of color matching Heidi. I'm, I'm, I learned to recognize the difference between timbers like Paduk and Bubinga, both of which are in the red spectrum, but from across a room <laughs> because I needed to be able to select those timbers for a fretboard or a body or a neck or whatever. And then um, various different reasons, uh, none of which were Crimson's fault at all. I, I ended up moving on and I now, for my day job, work in the retail sector. Um, but I work in a shop called Yandles, which is a woodworking tools and machinery supplier. It's also a sawmill and a cafe and an arts and craft shop and a gallery and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I work predominantly in the woodworking center. So we sell a wide range of exotic and native timber. Um, I'm the on-site subject matter expert on a number of different things, including identifying timber tool sharpening for wood turners, uh, bandsaw setup and modification, 
and various other different things, none of which I thought was ever likely. It didn't even enter my head at all. Um, but when I started working there six years ago, um, I assumed I would be bottom of the rung when it came to knowledge. Uh, but it turns out I was I was slightly above middle. And actually, the gaps in my knowledge, not surprisingly, were more about how their systems operated and what products they did and didn't supply. Um, so I was I've been quite fortunate in in those kind of regards. So I've got a lot of on and off throughout from university in various places, working in a retail environment and understanding pricing and things. One of my jobs now is as a buyer for the business. So I have to go out and source products from various places and identify, you know, have they been manufactured in Europe or in China and places like that? What's the cost difference? What's the quality difference? Um, what is it? What's our supplier selling and what's our competitor selling? How are we going to compete? Can we get anything that is a unique selling point? Um, all of those kind of things, which lovingly filter across into trying to make my own business work. Um, so I'm, I'm able to understand about markups and margins. And if I'm talking to someone who's talking about wholesaling stuff with me, I understand that they're going to want to make X amount of profit. So I have to be able to sell at a certain price, but also make sure I still make money. And then it's their choice whether they think they can retail it or not and all of that kind of good thing. So um, that, that's where I stand on that one. But if we were to uh, go back on then just a few more questions to kind of find out about each other. Um, interestingly, you mentioned looking at glass, Heidi. So if you couldn't do your current craft anymore, would, is glass making something you would do instead or would it be something different completely? No way. Glass making, glass making is terrifying. <laughs> 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 I tried it. Um, there's a local glass maker that, you know, gives intro to glass making lessons. Oh my goodness. Like are, they, are we talking glass blowing or glass yeah, making? Yeah, glass blowing. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah. Uh, no, that it just, that, that heat all the time and you're close to it. I'm okay with a kiln. <laughs> the you kiln can, can stay away. way over way. Um, I guess, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot in my history. I've been a photographer. I've been a musician. I've, um, I've dabbled in, in journalism, music journalism as well, Russ. Um, but Wow, None yeah. of it really hit, checked all the boxes for me, like ceramics. Um, and and I think that's why it's endured six years like for me. And it's a day in, day out thing. So I don't know that I could reinvent that passion, uh, to be completely honest. Like I may just, um, if I could segue and teach, if, if I could, like, if I lost both my arms and I couldn't throw anymore, um, <laughs> I, I would love to, to teach and critique people's work and, and help them, you know, work through problems and challenges. I, I mean, it's adjacent, but it's not totally giving up the passion for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, true. Very true. Is it something you've ever thought about, Ross? Only in nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> no, um. I'm the first in my family who, or of, of my parents, like both of them are very acad academical, and both of my brothers are also very academical, or academical and artsy, depending on how you view it. But me being the first going like into a craft and kind of hardcore into a craft at that, I would like to stick in that, and I don't know what I would do. I might be like going into some traditional timber framing. Or something else that's fairly physical because I like that aspect. Or if I were to just flip the formula completely, uh, go hardcore into like competitive swing dancing or something like it. Okay, um, we're not going to go into describing exactly what swing dancing is in this episode. I'm sure we will in a future one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm not it, saying it your is, style. It, we will just say it is safe to Google. Okay, yes, it, is, yes. it is a genuine thing, um, and if you, you've got to look up and um, what's the particular. Is it Norwegian specific a swing dancing or is it no uh, West Coast swing actually is the one West Coast swing so there you go so I, I would be trying to get good at <laughs> if uh, if anyone wants to look that up then feel free to contact Rasmus on his his personal uh, his personal social media links later which we'll discuss later yeah um, we we have uh, I'm not sure about Heidi but I have personally witnessed some of his West Coast swing 
informal Norwegian dress at a wedding in the UK. Uh, and it was very delightful to uh, to behold, particularly when he got very upset that none of us English people who had drunk too much were able to dance anywhere near as well as he could. So um, <laughs> but that's 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 a conversation for another time. Um, it's it's funny actually because it it's something that um, you mentioned Heidi about. There's nothing else that you've you've kind of been that passionate about. Like you've you've been you've done other things, but the, the whole amount of and. I traditionally have been a person who has given up very easily on everything, um, except my marriage, fortunately. <laughs> um, but, you know, any any form, like I've owned a guitar since I was 10, but I still can't play. And I'm not one of those people who just says, I can't play. No, I, I can play a few chords and I can put them next to each other, but I can't look at a tune and practice and play it within like a day or anything like that. I, I, I'm not, I don't persevere enough. I get, I get bored. I need sort of a lot of hand holding through that kind of thing. Um, and wood turning, I was worried was going to be one of those same things. Like there were a few times where you made a mistake, so you'd get angry. So stuff flies across the workshop or you storm out and maybe you don't go back in the workshop or workspace for a couple of months. Um, but it is the first thing that I have consistently gone back to. There may be gaps between the times that I do anything, but I have consistently gone back and physically turned something or I've looked at videos of it or I've read books on it or I've I've been doing something to do with it, thinking about it or talking to people about it pretty much every week for the last six years. So whilst it might not be the hands-on kind of, you know, getting the correct practice in to master the craft, it's definitely present in my mind the whole time. Um, but Interestingly enough, and I couldn't think of a scenario how, for whatever reason, wood turning would suddenly disappear. But I, the more and more that I look at it, and particularly the more I look at the form and the shape of what I'm doing, the more and more I think that it would be very dangerous for me to ever have a go at pottery, uh, particularly throwing, because I could see myself getting lost quite quickly in trying to master creating form on a wheel. Um and I, I do genuinely think if I, if I couldn't do, if I couldn't do uh, <laughs> that kind of wood turning, I would assume no woodworking at all, and it would probably be ceramics and pottery. Um, but most, most specifically, wheel throwing as opposed to slab building or anything else, because I think it's just that element of seeing the shape emerge in front of you in the same way as you would wood turning. Um, I, I, the greatest respect, Raz. Metalworking is too messy. <laughs> I know. I know ceramics is messy as well, but it's like wash off messy as opposed to like I've I my hands are now permanently black with with the kind of filed dust and kind of in, ingrained into my skin kind of messy. Yeah, it it sticks for a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My hands are pretty dyed with uh, the dark clay I've been using. <laughs> well, I look like a mechanic. <laughs> oh well, you know. Well, I have a I have a segue question from from that point. Um, so we've all started as absolute beginners in in wood turning in um, blacksmithing and yeah. in ceramics. But from your point of view, and I'll start with Dan. Um, your point of view, your very first couple of goes. What made you stick with it? Like you did say like, oh, something to explode and I, I, I explode basically uh, just to condense what you said earlier. But what made you fall in love with it? So um, I have for various reasons that we won't go into for a long, long time had uh, an awful lot of pent up frustration in uh, not anger. I don't have anger issues. But I only recently came to understand that, um, as we all are, I'm probably on some form of a spectral wavelength of something so I'm not neurotypical. Um, and so if things didn't go my way, the way that I expected them to in my head, I would get very frustrated very quickly. Um, wood turning is the first thing where if it didn't go my way, it was because I could only blame myself. Anything else, I was I would freely blame other things. Like I can't play guitar because this guitar's not the right size for me. I can't play guitar because the neck's too small for this, and I've got big hands. And so you know, you you would find mm. reasons why it wasn't working for you. And it was never about me not putting practice in. 
wood turning for me was like, you know, the lathe works, the tool sharp and the tool works. So the only thing that can be going wrong now is the way that you're using those things and interacting with them. And so despite me having some frustration, the frustration was not projecting outwards. It was realizing inwards that, oh no, this is me. So I either need to get better through watching other people, having tuition, or just practicing and just playing around and seeing what happens. Um, and I have also found that there's nothing quite mm. uh, like wood turning. You know, the whole concept of you're spinning a piece of wood at a couple of thousand revolutions per minute, you have a sharp piece of steel and you're introducing it to that piece of wood. You kind of have to focus on what's happening. And so anything else that's happened during that day, whether you're frustrated, whether or not you, you know, you've had some bad news or whatever else it might be, you can't think about any of that and your brain will quickly relax and you'll just kind of get lost in making the shapes, um, which can also then be a problem moving forwards when fatigue starts to kick in because you haven't realized that you need to take a break now and go and have a drink or and sit down on a sandwich or something. Um, but it's it, that's why I think really is because it was the first thing to kind of tell me, no, you're the problem. And it wasn't, it wasn't a tutor stood next to me saying that. It was my realization. And so it was a really big learning moment for me. Um, and it's a really good mental health thing for me, which is probably why I can also see the appeal of throwing on a wheel because it, I can just kind of, you just hit into the zone of it and kind of you're focused on this thing in front of you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, uh, deep and meaningful answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And <laughs> Ras, how about beating metal? I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's metal and it's fire. What what does like? <laughs> uh, I'm a bit more seriously though. Uh, I I started doing karate when I was six years old, just to sneak a bit more backstory. Mm. Uh, but I had a very traditional sensei. Granted, he he was Norwegian, but he was proper Japanese old school. So, which meant that often enough, we would spend an hour practicing one technique. And I just love that. I love like get like almost falling into almost a meditative trance around doing something super basic as well as you can. And basic uh, blacksmithing is nothing but that. It's all about just getting the hammer to hit exactly where you want it to. And I mean, blacksmithing as a as a craft hasn't really changed, or the basic techniques in blacksmithing hasn't changed since it was invented three five thousand years ago. It's just better tools and better materials. But it's something about just the, how basic that is, that all you're doing is you're shaping it with some kinetic force. And apart from that, it's, yeah, you need to manage your heat and your steel and your techniques, and you need to not go too far there, and you need to avoid burning it and cracking it. And it's so many other nuances to it that makes it really complex. But every single step in blacksmithing is simple. There's just a hell of a lot of them that you need to keep in mind at the same time to be, I mean, proficient at it, I guess. Is that sort of an adequate answer? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, you know, what I, I feel like I can take from both of you is, is th that it, for me as a ceramicist, it is the repetition. It is the process. It is trusting the process. It's, it's yeah. knowing that once I understand the muscle memory of a certain form, I can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And I can get lost in the repetition. A lot of people ask me like, and I'm, I'm sure Ras, this is, this probably comes up for you too, is like, how can you make so many of the same piece? And Dan, as, as you're building out bevel, it's probably the same thing. Like, how can you sit there and just keep making the same piece over and over and over again? And really it, re it does come into the play where you've, you've got that Zen moment where you're like, okay, this is no longer complicated for my brain. It's no longer complicated for my muscles. It's now in a place where I measure out my material. I put it where it needs to go and everything just falls into place. And it's such a nice, um, a nice getaway from the news, from the family, from everything. And <laughs> I, I think, you know, talking to other creatives too that do different disciplines, it all seems to really go back to that finding yourself, finding yourself and, and not to be cliche, but yeah. centering yourself. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yes, very much so. I think it's interesting as well that all three of us will make batches of the same thing. And I think there is a big difference between, and we can have this whole conversation in a later episode, but um, I, I can't remember whether it was uh, shouting out other podcasts here. I'm not sure whether it was on a Fools with Tools podcast episode or on a Full Blast uh, podcast episode, but the discussion between the difference between a craftsperson and an artist. Um, and in this particular instant, instance, and that's not to say one is better than the other, but for me, an artist tends to make one-off pieces that, that speak for themselves predominantly, whereas a craftsperson, whilst they make, may make one-off pieces, the lot of the focus tends to be on on uh, either batches of the same shape and form, maybe with different colouring, or it's a collection that's all based around the same thing. Um, but that that's a conversation we can have another time. But it, it is definitely something that we've all um, we've all got there. Okay, so final question then before we we wrap up our our teaser episode that was going to be 15, 20 minutes long and is currently set at half an hour. Um, <laughs> Raz, if you could do it all again, what would you change? We'll limit you to three things. I, I mean, being smarter and more mature when I started out and more skilled probably would be a big thing. Uh, honestly, not having an apprenticeship is something that I'm not sure if it has set me back, but it like at at this current ten year time frame, but it definitely I noticed a difference how I remember I was after coming out of school and how some of my friends who just finished their apprenticeship are and how many things, how many different things they get to got to learn in a really short time frame because they, f they followed a, like a nationally national mandated curriculum for apprenticeships. But just sorry to interrupt you there, but do you feel though that, having not done the apprenticeship gives you an, a different kind of edge, which is you haven't followed a national standard. You followed your own path. So you're now a decade later, whilst you might not have some of the skill set that they've got, you are now, you're running your own business. Yeah. And that business currently has at least three different avenues of revenue, if not four. Four. Yeah. Yeah. So after 10 years, you're still in that place that a lot of other people from an apprenticeship might well have got to but it, but you've you've found your own path there so you you're not uh what i'm trying to say is you're not like that carbon copy kind yes. of thing and i think i think that's why i don't i struggle to see if i actually would want to do anything different i just recognize that that being a drawback that was in okay. place years ago but uh, as you say a lot of the i uh, i i literally yesterday come back from a national blacksmithing meetup here in norway uh, and most of the blacksmiths there not, do nothing like the things I do. I do almost solely batch work of products that I develop myself and I try to sell either at markets or online. Pretty much everybody else is doing either one of pieces or they're doing single commission works for people. Okay. Where that be like they need to make axes and yeah, they, they gather up maybe orders of five timber framing axes for five different people, maybe make 30 axes in one go. But it's all pre-ordered by people for the most part. Or they get a railing job or a gate job or something other architectural. But that's jobs that either like come to them or they need to find, but it's like single persons all the time. So far, it seems like I'm the only one who makes a living, at least in Norway that is, of making single uh, products without a buyer and batches of them and a lot of them. See that's really interesting. We're gonna we're gonna have to delve into that on a, yeah. on another episode, I think. Uh, but but like uh, just compared to the wood turning thing, like you do, like uh, coming into sort of a lot of the blacksmithing of where I am I am now through the maker community, that seemed like the normal thing to me, and I completely forgot about what's traditional in Norway. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm not You've sure. You created it's, uh, your own. Um basically your own market kind of which is both really stupid but also <laughs> it's kind of how it ended up working because no one else is doing that i am feeling it's not a niche stupid that if it works yeah it's well, not stupid if it works <laughs> I'm not, yeah well i'm not saying it's been easy uh 
But so like, yeah, things I might have decided to do differently could have been to actually hold on and got an apprenticeship early on before I started my own business. Another thing is that I might have decided to get some part-time job or a full-time job early on to save up money so I can buy more of the tools that makes all of production easier. Yeah. Okay. And I, I mean, it is things in that venue, but being now 10 years ahead, I'm happy where I'm at. I just recognize these were the struggles I had. That's, yeah, no, that's good. And what about you then, Heidi? If you could do it all again, what would you change? Um, start sooner. <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband and I have this, this conversation a lot. Like, man, if I, if I would have known that this would make my heart swell so much earlier, um, I would, I would be so much further ahead or maybe I would be doing this full time or whatever. And for him, so he's a union carpenter and he started out late in life in, in the apprenticeship program. And, um, you know, that, that sets him back financially. It, it means that he's not embedded with a shop and he has a family to worry about. So, you know, layoffs happen early when you're an apprentice. Um, so, you know, he's had to endure those kind of things. And both of us are just like, oh man, I, I wish that I would have stumbled into this sooner. Um, but it, it is one of those things where you can't, you can't change the past, but it, it definitely would have been, um, fortuitous to have been able to have more of a foundation to build on, um, prior. However, I think some of the things that I learned in the industry that I'm in, in print industry, um, as far as like managing clients, managing schedules, managing timelines, it's like, uh, you know, which, which benefits me more, having more experience in the craft or having all of this additional experience that can help my business. Um, so I, in, in some ways, I feel like it was a good trade-off. Um, so oppo- as opposed to Ras, who yeah. kind of winged it a bit uh, right out of school. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, I, <laughs> I built my business with a solid understanding of, um, you know, how sales work, how um, marketing works, what type of clientele that I want to work with versus the ones I can find um, and that kind of thing. So that did benefit me having that delayed start. How about you, Dan? Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I've asked the question, but I've not necessarily... I, I think I'm, I'm kind of very similar to both of you in some regards that I wish that I had discovered that I enjoyed working with my hands a lot sooner in life. Um, I'm going to blame my brother for not doing that because my older brother knew that he wanted to be a carpenter since he was about 11. Something to do with being called Joseph, I think. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so because that was always his thing and people always said he was good at it, I never even bothered trying to play with wood. Um, and so therefore I didn't realize that I enjoyed making things, uh, until uh, literally just only about 10 years ago and I'm going to be 40 next year. So, um, that that's a frustration. That is a deep seated frustration in me that I wish that I had I realised I enjoyed making things a lot sooner. Um, but certainly, I don't begrudge the kind of different jobs that I've had and the experience that I've had from those that I know has informed me being able to do what I do now. I think definitely I wish that um, I had realised people get ahead through making friends with people. And it, you know, it's whilst there is an element of what you know, and it's not all about, oh, it's not what you know, it's who you know, but just realizing that making friends with people who you possibly would think are out of reach. I was at a market a couple of weeks ago at a, um, a restaurant, uh, where the guy who is the owner there, who's the, like the, the chef owner there, um, the previous chef was a Michelin star chef. Um, so I, I ate there for like a special birthday a few years back, phenomenal food, absolutely loved it. COVID happened, they shut down, they've just started opening again and they, they launched a garden party and wanted some market stalls there. So I went along, uh, and the chef there saw all my stuff and was like, oh, I just need to give you my number. We need to work together and we'll, we'll make some stuff. 
And in my head, I'm like, oh, that would be what would be really awesome is to basically go and have a tasting menu with him and build a whole range of stuff around his food. But I didn't say that. But he was the one who said to me, was what we'll do is we'll book a time, you come down, you bring a load of stuff that you've made, we'll give, have some rough ideas beforehand, and bring it down. I will cook a load of stuff and we will have a meal and just see how it looks and, and what works. Oh, that's cool. That is really Which cool. Which is exactly what I was thinking. And that's what he then said. But I, you know, still even now, I've got that little bit where you want to, you want to push it. You want to be the one to just be bold enough to say, hey, show off in front of me because that's what I'm here for. I, I want some free, really highly high end food <laughs> at, at an interview for whether or not you want my stuff. But it's not, it's not about just getting the free thing. It's about saying, hey, look, um, I mean, it's like Rasmus. Hey, you're a blacksmith. I'm a woodturner. Theoretically, the two don't necessarily work together. You've got to hunt to find something that works together. Everything I make is kitchenware or tableware. You want an excuse to make a knife and fork set. Yep, basically. So you so you've bought some of my plates wholesale to sell in Norway. So I can now get to say that I sell my product internationally. Yeah. Um but it took that conversation. But, you know, you and I had been friends for well over a year before we even considered having that conversation. Um, so it's it's that thing of taking those chance meetings and being willing to just throw it out there and see if something sticks. Because more often than not, the person stood in front of you will either respect the boldness, politely decline, or they'll consider it and come back to you in the future. And you don't lose in any of those situations. No. Because the worst thing that can happen is they just say no and you're no worse off. But trying to teach myself that, I think that's the major thing is like, you know, you're stood there, you have an idea and you think, oh, this would be really cool if this and this worked. Um, and having the courage to actually just have that conversation uh, with the person in front of you. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of um, that's kind of my uh, thing there. Um, I think people will have learned quite a lot about us in the last 40 minutes. Um, hopefully this gives you... And a, hopefully a lot more in the coming episodes. Well, absolutely. But hopefully <laughs> this gives everyone a flavor of um, the kind of conversation that we will have. They will be a lot more structured around specific themes that are aimed at helping people go from having your, your hobby craft um, and taking it all the way through to setting up a market stall or setting up shop even, which is why we are called what we're called. It's real clever. Yeah, it's really clever. It took us a lot of time to come up with this name, it especially did. adding the extra <laughs> P and the E on the end. Um, so before we go then, uh, Rasmus, where can people find you if they want to message you about uh, swing dancing or blacksmith questions? I'm at Rasmus Lowen on all of the social places. And my website is lowensmeer.no if you happen to speak like any of the Viking languages. <laughs> okay, so uh, although all of these will be in, in sort of notes underneath the show on the, whichever app you're on, just in case those of you couldn't quite understand him, his name is Rasmus Lowen, R-A-S-M-U-S-L-O-E-N, two separate words. Yeah. Heidi. <laughs> W-H-I-T-E-P-O-T-T-E-R-Y. <laughs> You can find me at um, Whitehall Pottery on most places, uh, including Instagram, Facebook, and the YouTubes. Um, I'm really looking forward to what this adventure is going to bring and and what help I can get in thinking about the things that are in my head and getting them out. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to share with you guys, uh, both of you, uh, things that I've been able to do and I can't wait to hear about your journeys too. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun uh, and hopefully a lot of people come along for the ride. Um, so for my stuff, I am found at uh, Bevelwood UK is the Instagram and uh, the website address and I'm on Facebook as well, all those kind of things. Um, Bevel is the company name, Bevelwood UK, because if you just look up Bevel, you'll find and men's hairdressing suppliers, which is international, frustratingly. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please leave us some feedback, sign up, hit any bells required to be notified about next episodes, and we will speak for you soon.
Goodbye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you.